Why is there a Lenin statue in the Lower East Side? Hey, this is Kyle with Free Tours by Foot. And I'm here today again to do another one of these walking tours. Uh, today we're going to be on the Lower East Side. There's a lot of really great, interesting history. A lot of different cultural groups that have come through the Lower East Side. So I was going to walk around to show you some of the sites, show you some of the history behind the buildings, because there's a bunch of buildings as well that you'd look at and you would never know that there's a long-standing interesting history there. So we're gonna start off, and I know we got this cool mural right behind me, but that's actually not where we're gonna start off. So we're gonna start right next to the Lower East Side in the Two Bridges neighborhood. From there, we're gonna walk a block or so and find ourselves on the edge of the Lower East Side at the historic Eldridge Street Synagogue. After that, we'll walk over to Seward Park, which is the largest park in the Lower East Side and filled with quirky monuments, nice playgrounds for kids. It's a really great place to relax when you visit the neighborhood. We'll take a quick walk up Essex Street, hear the history of the infamous Ludlow Street Jail, and turn down Orchard Street to get the full history of the, one of the most important institutions of the Lower East Side, the Tenement Museum. Now the final leg of the tour, we will turn around Norfolk Street to see the oldest surviving synagogue in New York and continue down Houston for some great food recommendations. There's a very specific reason why I chose this spot. Technically, we're not even in the Lower East Side right now. Technically, we're in a neighborhood called Two Bridges, but I want to see this cemetery. This cemetery is the second oldest cemetery in New York City behind Trinity Church. It's one of the very few things you can find from the 1600s. This was in use from 1656 all the way till 1833. It's really a great first symbolic thing to see because this was a Jewish cemetery. This is actually part of the oldest Jewish congregation in North America called the First Sarath Israel. This is a good emblematic kind of symbol of all of the Lower East Side, even though we're not technically in the Lower East Side. You'll see right there it's a Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. That's because at that period of time in the 1600s into the 1700s, you're mostly seeing a Western Jewish population. That's going to be different than what we talk about a little bit later on, where it's more from the Eastern Europe, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. Just giving you a few more views of the cemetery. Uh, we're going to walk past this, and we're going to kind of do a long, slow approach into the Lower East Side where I'm going to talk about it, but that is a symbolic nature because the reason why that cemetery was located here is it was further away from the original Dutch colony, the original Dutch settlement. That cemetery was actually referenced during the during the excuse me the Revolutionary War. It was seen as a good strategic position, so there was uh, kind of embattlements that were set up alongside. And then later, the British actually used face plates from some of those graves to melt down and create bullets. But again, what I'm getting off to is the fact that this was a little bit further. This is the Lower East Side, and at the time, this wouldn't have been called the Lower East Side because there's nothing that it's lower than. It would just be kind of seen as the east side. We're going to back up a little bit, though. We're doing a long walk into the lower east side. We're going to walk underneath, as you see, way in the distance over there. That's the Manhattan Bridge. We're going to be walking underneath that. It's kind of fun to just walk around. You, I know you see a lot of different signage that indicates that we're actually around Chinatown. And that's true. We actually are very close to Chinatown at this point. You'll see more and more of that even when we're in the Lower East Side. But again, backing up. First, people that were in this area before any Europeans, I hope we all know, were the American Indians. Now, the American Indians was the Lenape tribe, and there were a few settlements of the Lenape people around this area. Usually it was during the winter, they would be inland, but along the summer, they'd go all the way up to the coast and they'd do fishing. Unfortunately, there was a pretty major massacre of the American Indian in this area, and it was the 1643 massacre at Corlier's Hook. This was unprovoked attacks from the Dutch that killed about 40 of the Lenape people. So it is kind of important to acknowledge that. That did happen around here. And when I say Corlier's Hook, that's because originally the title under the Dutch in this area was Corlier's Hook. If you kind of see along the coast, it looks a little bit like it hooks around, so that's why they called it that. You would know that the Dutch would call this area the Bowery as well, which is basically the way that you say farm in Dutch. The most famous name of which would be Delancey, so you maybe have heard of that street Delancey as well. After the Erie Canal gets built, 
and this is 1825 when that happens, then there's this big, huge immigration boom throughout all of New York. And the population that you would see first off that would come to the Lower East Side would be a German population. So this would be around the 1840s. You'd see about 5 million Germans immigrate. And there was a lot of political instability. You know, German, Germany hadn't really quite been unified at this point, but they actually called the Lower East Side originally Little Germany. And you've seen a bunch of beer houses sprout up. You would have seen them be mostly furniture makers. There was some, uh, you know, piano, piano makers as well. That was the real first immigration boom that you would have seen to the Lower East Side, which is interesting because you usually more associate the Lower East Side when you think of a Jewish population. And I know we started off at that cemetery, which was the Jewish cemetery. Again, that was more of a Western Jewish. This I'm talking about the Anakanaski Jews, which come from Eastern Europe. Now, when that happens, there was a series of attacks in Europe, and so again, People were fleeing political instability, and they were coming and settling down into New York, and specifically what would be, then be later known as we know it today as the Lower East Side. I gotta tell you, there's so many people that settled into the Lower East Side that the population goes crazy. By 1910, there were 70 people per 5,000 square feet in the Lower East Side, and that's compared to 12, 12 people per 5,000 square feet currently today in the Lower East Side, and that's compared to in Los Angeles, there's one person per 5,000 square feet. So you get a sense, really the population was about 70 times as dense in the Lower East Side in the period that we're talking about. Uh, you probably saw when we were walking past there a little bit that there are a lot of outdoor markets, and you associate that more with like Chinatown right now, but that was a part of a really big part of, uh, of life in the Lower East Side as well. You can just get a good view of the Manhattan Bridge right there. It's kind of just a nice shot. And when we walk under the Manhattan Bridge, then we're really getting into the heart of what would be called the Lower East Side, and that's what we're doing right now, right? But anyway, getting back to the push carts. The push carts were, you, you, when you think of the Lower East Side and when you think of all these images you've seen, maybe of like really crowded streets, you see a ton of push carts. And that was because it was really cheap to get a push cart and sell items along the street side. So you could usually get one in those days for about 10 cents, and then you'd get up at the crack of dawn, and you'd go fight everyone for a spot on the side of the street, and you'd see a lot of immigrants using this as a way to get a leg up. Now, that all ended in 1938, but this was a big part of life in New York, especially at the Lower East Side, because refrigeration had not been invented in the late 1800s. So this is a way for people to all get a lot of food. Usually you'd go out every single day, usually you'd pick out what you could around there. We're specifically going to be turning onto the street, we're walking along what's called Eldridge Street. This is going to be a little surprising to you, but I know you see right now there are a lot of Chinese businesses in here, a lot of Chinese writing. And pretty soon you're going to see right across the street over here on the right hand side, oh there you see, off in the distance, there is a synagogue. This synagogue is emblematic of that population I was talking about. So this is the Eldridge Street Synagogue. The Eldridge Street Synagogue actually goes back to 1887. That's when it was opened. And it was one of the first synagogues erected in the United States by the Eastern European Jews. This is really important because it was massive, big, huge building, had a big huge sanctuary seating capacity of like a thousand people and it was a major center of life for the Jewish population here on the Lower East Side. Again the period would for this would be like the late 1800s, it opens in 1887. For about 50 years all the way until about the 1930s this was a major center. You see a lot of really cool beautiful work on the outside right there. You can go on tours of this but the really important part of this building is that it started to dwindle over time. As the population spread out more across New York City, then you would have seen the Jewish population moving away from the Lower East Side as well, up to the Upper East Side, up to, uh, you would have seen the Hasidic population go more into Brooklyn. And so all of this would have kind of s separated out 
And the synagogue, really by the 1950s, then the population here was almost zero. And it was out of operation from the 50s all the way to the 1980s. So for decades, this was a dilapidated building. When they went back into it in the 80s, they found like a skeleton in the basement at one point. There was so much dust at different places that you could write your name or your initials in the levels of caked dust. So there was a massive restoration project that began, and it began in 2007, and it cost $20 million to restore this to create what's now called the Museum at Eldridge Street. So I know when you're seeing this right here, you're seeing what looks like a synagogue, and it is a synagogue, but now it's got more of a history angle to it. It talks about the American Jewish history as, lo as well as the Lower East Side history. So you can go on tours of that. It's been open even during the pandemic as well. That was also designated as a National Historic Landmark in 1996 because it was one of the very first synagogues er erected in the United States. But there are more reasons why that's, the Jewish population is important to the Lower East Side as well. Um, and that has to do with what was called the Yiddish Theater District, which is not very far away. Now, all of this in terms of locations is a little confusing because there's been relabeling of everything over time. So when we think of the Lower East Side, we think of a very specific point, and then we think of the East Village as different. The East Village is what you'd call kind of above Houston Street. It, it's a little bit further away. We're going to end the tour around Houston Street. But historically, all of this would have just been called the East Side. That's because, it, as I was kind of referencing before, there was no Upper East Side at this point. There was just the East Side. And this would have extended even up into what would later be called the East Village. The East Village gets rebranded as such when you see real estate developers trying to come up with some new catchy names for it. So above Houston Street, you would have seen some of the Yiddish theater population and the theater district. And that would have later gone to inspire such things as vaudeville. And even you could say Broadway as well. So that period of the late 1800s, seeing this huge influx of Jewish population here in the Lower East Side was really important. Where we're walking right now, kind of into the heart, we're walking towards Seward Park right now, where we're going to talk about some more things. So we're walking across Allen Street right now. Perhaps we're, we're approaching another very important street, and that is Orchard Street. I have this joke that I tell people oftentimes that everything in New York is very literally named. We're really bad at naming things. So when you see, you know, Wall Street was a wall, you see Water Street is where the water was, and here Orchard Street, which was where there was an orchard. And that has to do with the original thought behind it, which when we talked about the Bowery, when we talked about how there were farms everywhere, then that is also the fact that there was an orchard that was a Delancey orchard and the orchard street passes all the way up. We're going to kind of crisscross with orchard street. In fact, when we talk about the, when we talk specifically about the tenement museum and about tenements, which will be later on, that is on orchard street. So that's an important street that we're going to come back to. Ludlow as well, which we're going to be crossing over right here is another preview of coming attractions, if you will because we're going to be talking about the Ludlow Street Jail in just a few stops as well. But now where we're coming into view, you see Seward Park straight ahead. There's a corner over here, and you see us approaching kind of over to the right over there. We're going to be approaching kind of quickly as I scoot across the street and make sure I'm not getting hit by anything. This is what's called Strauss Square. This is named after Nathan Strauss. I know that name probably doesn't mean very much to you, but you probably have heard of one of his creations, something called Macy's. I know you're saying as well, you're like, well, wait a minute, isn't that named after someone named Macy? It gets a little confusing because he partnered up with uh, a man named R.H. Macy, and so it was named after R.H. Macy, but Strauss was a big part of that, right? It was the largest department store at the time when it opened in 1902. So Strauss Square over here is named after him specifically. This building that we're seeing straight ahead, this was the Jewish Daily Forward building. This was a, Yid a Yiddish-only newspaper, and this was constructed and completed in 1912. 
big location right across the street from Seward Park. And this was really at the height of when the Jewish Daily Forward was in, was uh, well known. So <laughs> we're entering into Seward Park. There's one particular statue that I just really love. Doesn't have a lot to do specifically with the Lower East Side, but I find it really kind of quirky and fun when you hide away just in this circle over here. There's a statue of a dog in this circle, right? And that's because the statue of the dog is of a dog named Togo. You've probably never heard of Togo the dog, but you've probably heard of his more famous counterpart named Balto. Balto is more associated with, uh, you know, there are cartoons about him, the whole thing. So you're saying, who is Togo? Why does he get a statue right here? That's because it travels all the way back to Alaska. It has nothing to do with the Lower East Side, but it's an amazing story. Where in 1925, there was a diphtheria outbreak in Alaska. And there were several dog sleds that had to transport an antitoxin all the way up in the middle of nowhere in 1925, in the middle of winter. And so there was a relay race to bring this antitoxin all the way up to Alaska, a gnome specifically, really far away. There were 150 different sled dogs that were used, and the most popular of which that everyone kind of knew and got a lot of fame from that was a dog named Balto. Balto was the one who crossed the finish line. However, the problem is everyone remembered the dog that finished it, and Balto got its own statue. That gets a really big statue in Central Park. Everybody, he starts going on stadium tours. So literally, like, Balto would be in a stadium, and they just bring the dog in and imagine, like, something like the Beatles, but with just a dog up front. Balto gets so famous that uh, apparently the musher for Togo, another dog, said that Togo got really sad because Togo actually ran over twice as long as Balto in worse conditions, but wasn't the final dog, so didn't get the same level of publicity. So that statue, I know it's a long way to get to that statue, was meant to rectify the sadness of Togo, and that statue uh, was actually moved there uh, just a few years ago to that specific spot. So, again, it doesn't really have a lot to do with the Lower East Side, but it's one of those little hidden away things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in the Lower East Side and specifically in Seward Park, right? And we're going to be en exiting out of Seward Park right here, getting back onto the street. Now, most of us, when we see this, and I keep referencing this, and we saw this at the very, very beginning, but a lot of what people see when they look around the Lower East Side is a lot of uh, Chinese writing, and so people associate this with a large Chinese population. And that is actually more of a recent thing. So Chinatown itself starts further away. There was one guy named Ah Ken, and I'll do another video all about them. But Ah Ken basically starts what we would call the modern day Chinatown. And the Chinese population was still pretty small, even in the run up to the early 1800s. And then it gets even smaller because there is a series of laws that were called the Chinese Exclusion Acts which basically barred all Chinese from immigrating into the United States, and that was in the late 1800s. The effect, by the way, of that was that there was about 5,000 male Chinese living in Chinatown in the early 1900s, and 23 women. So 5,000 to 23. This was relevant to the Lower East Side because after they, pa after they got rid of a lot of those uh, Chinese exclusion acts in the run-up to World War II, you see the Chinese population just really pop so then you see the massive influx of the Chinese population into New York. And that's when it really starts to spread out. So even if you go into like places like Little Italy, then there will be places that seem like they have a very authentic sounding name, but it's actually owned by a Chinese business owner at this point. So Chinatown is further away, but that's why you see a lot of the influence into even the Lower East Side right here. The thing that I'm going to be talking about next, now you see on the left-hand side, this really very ugly building that kind of, uh, it looks like a jail right there. And it's on the left-hand side. We're going to see more and more of it as we walk up closer and closer. That's a school. I know there's a lot of jokes to be made about the fact that it looks like a jail, but it's actually a school. But what's even more interesting is that was originally a jail. 
not that building specifically, but at this location. So just to review, it was a jail. That building got torn down. They built another building that looks just like a jail, but that's a school. <laughs> that was the Ludlow Street Jail. The Ludlow Street Jail was not like any other jail in New York City at the time. It gets constructed in 1862, and it was in operation for about 60 years or so. It took up the entire city block in that location right there. The Ludlow Street Jail, because, so there were a lot of really terrible conditions, prisons all around New York City, some on Roosevelt Island, and there was a lot of really bad publicity going on around New York City for all of the terrible conditions in the prison system. So in a response for that, they built the Ludlow Street Jail. And the response to that is that the Ludlow Street Jail was super nice. You can see uh, their drawings, you know, maybe we'll show some on the screen or maybe you can look these up yourself. If you Google Ludlow Street Jail, you'll see people in, you'll literally see men in top hats. You'll see that there are billiard tables. They even had velvet drapes and this was considered probably the highest quality jail in the entire United States. Naturally, as you'd expect, this was catering more to wealthy criminals more than anything. Probably the most famous inmate of the Ludlow Street Jail was a former mayor named William Boss Tweed. And William Tweed, Boss Tweed, as many people knew him as, was a very famous corrupt politician in New York City in the mid to late 1800s, had his fingers in a lot of pies. In fact, there's still today is what's called the Tweed Courthouse. The Tweed Courthouse is right behind City Hall building if you're in lower Manhattan. So you can just get another view of what would have originally been in that spot, the Ludlow Street Jail. Now looks like a jail, but is actually a school. <laughs> but William Tweed, that by the way, that getting back to the Tweed Courthouse, is notable because he actually ends up being on trial in his own courthouse because William Tweed probably stole close to about a billion dollars worth of taxpayer money in today's money, translated into today's dollars, right? So he actually gets put originally in a jail on Roosevelt Island and he escaped. He escaped by swimming across part of the East River rather he used like part of a door, then he goes and hides out in uh, Spain, then he's found by someone who recognized him from a political cartoon and he's brought back and put in the Ludlow Street Jail. And so he was one famous person that was in that spot. Another famous person was someone named Victoria Woodhull. And Victoria Woodhull was widely agreed to be the first woman to ever run for president of the United States and that was in 1872. It's a little complicated because she was running for president. She wasn't eligible because she was a woman and she was challenging that notion. So she's seen as an early leader in the suffrage movement for women. Um, she was actually younger than the mandated age. And so that disqualified her as well. So she was running for president. She was the first woman to do so. But there was a lot of reasons why she wasn't specifically eligible. But that was kind of beyond the point, right? She also nominated as her vice president, Frederick Douglass, um, who didn't even know that he was her uh, running mate when he was running, when she was running for president. She was put into that prison, not because of that specifically, but because she was publishing what were seen as obscene materials, all having to do with uh, her advocacy of what she called free love, which is also the freedom to marry, divorce, spare children regardless of social restriction or government interference. So her passing all of that out, put her in prison, put her into the, that specific jail right there as well. So two of the more famous people that you would have seen. Now, um, I'm getting a little bit behind in all of this because we're back on Orchard Street and you see all those people hanging out on the corner over there. This is all a part of the Tenement Museum. The Tenement Museum is at the corner over here Tenement Museum is a very important cultural institution in New York, over here on Orchard Street. We're a little bit further up when we, than where we were before. That is because tenements were a really important feature of life, specifically in the Lower East Side. This is where we get the term tenement from, not this specific building, but in the Lower East Side. What you're seeing right now was an actual tenement building. I'm going to back up a little bit. 
because I know a lot of you don't actually know what I'm talking about when I say the word tenement. Tenement, I know that you know that New Yorkers live in very small apartments, but what you need to do is imagine that kind of same small apartment put many, many people in the same space and basically take away the bathroom because there'd usually maybe be one bathroom for an entire building. You may be saying exactly how many people would be in one of these buildings and there'd usually be about a hundred people living in just like a building like that. Now today you'd see probably about 20 maybe in a building like this. There's usually kind of divided up into four spaces within a floor but back in the day for a building just like that over a hundred people squeezed within them. The conditions were really poor, really terrible and so a lot of people in lower Manhattan didn't even really realize just how bad the conditions were and a lot even still today as part of the tenement museum there's uh, trying to get the word out of just what the conditions were like at that time this was with all of the influx of immigration you would have seen these tenement buildings created. Now, a guy named Jacob Rees came in later on to document just how bad the conditions were, so he did kind of a weird thing. Go into people's homes without asking them and took pictures of them. <laughs> and what makes this even seem a little bit stranger is that he was one of the first people to use flash photography. So like imagine you're like sleeping in your bed and a flash wakes you up and you're like, what was that? And then he's just like, sorry, and leaves. And he wasn't doing that just to be weird. And there was part in the pun, but they hadn't really developed the actual ethics around photography at that point. So they didn't know that that's that was not okay to do but he went in and documented a lot of this so if you look up or if you you know buy the book which you still in print how the other half lives then there's a tremendous documentation of the late 1800s of these buildings very candid shots right so the tenement museum which we sh I showed you just about a block away over there before we crossed over canal the Tenement Museum is a really important cultural institution to New York, and it's worth going to visit. There's, When you go and visit it, you need to book a time. It's not like a museum where you can just go wander through, because they take you through different sections of that building and different people who live there at different times. So the most recent time that I went, I went to for the uh, Irish immigration section where they talked about an actual Irish family that lived there, right there, and they've done extensive research. So it's really worth going and checking out that specific building. This is something that uh, maybe is a deep cut for people, but I like to, since we're walking past it, wasn't really planning on talking about it since we're walking past it, this building in the corner on the right over there, which I'm showing you, uh, if any of you know the band The Beastie Boys, then uh, that is Paul's Boutique. So that cover for that their album, Paul's Boutique, is actually at that specific location. It actually has nothing to do with that anymore at all. Just like to point that out, one of those weird little quirky facts that you'd never really expect. And this is where my weird little tra transition comes into play, because we kind of skipped ahead a tiny little bit, because where we were, are walking now, we just talked about the Beastie Boys had an album cover. We're walking to another place where it, actually the Wu-Tang Clan filmed or had a picture for one of their album covers. And it is also a former synagogue, but this one's been converted. The last one we talked about, which was on Eldred Street, that was converted into a museum. This one's been converted into more of an arts center at this point. So that's where we're walking currently right now. I do I love to stop here because you get this view in the distance of this big statue up on top of the roof over there. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. But that's right next to you, just right over to the right over there is the is the synagogue that I'm going to be talking about. Currently, it's called the Angel Oren San Center. But originally, the synagogue we're going to right now, that's actually the oldest surviving synagogue in New York City. It's the old, fourth oldest surviving synagogue building in the United States. So it's older than the one on Eldred Street. It opens in 1849, and it would have been a German population. The services would have been in German at that time. Also notable because the service had uh, musical instruments, it had women and men together, and so it was what they were labeled as moderately traditionalist, but a little bit more liberalized than others. This at one point had the largest Jewish population 
attending services in the United States. Now, similar to the Eldridge Street one, when the population moved away, then this would have been abandoned largely by the, up until about the 60s and 70s here, by the 1974, there was hardly anyone that was attending service at that point. And so it was abandoned, it was vandalized. So there was a Jewish Spanish painter named Angel Oren Sanz, who he bought it in 18, excuse me, in 1986. He restored it, he created it into an art gallery, a performance space, and then that's why, you know, when I say that the Wu-Tang Clan had a space, had photographs in the basement, that's what's going on right there. So they'll have a lot, of, that was for their album, uh, Enter the Wu-Tang, right there. You do get this view to the side. I just love that statue at the top, the Lenin statue. That is actually Lenin that's supposed to be. So you see the you see the synagogue right there, and then you look up just right next to it on top of that building is Lenin looking down on you. So you might rightly say, why is there a Lenin statue in what's now in the Lower East Side? Very expensive housing. Doesn't exactly seem like it fits. What's kind of crazy about this is this, this Vladimir Lenin statue actually came from Soviet Russia. That's where it was built. It was completed right before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so they kind of just didn't know what to do with it. Then there was an artist who saw it, he purchased it. And this building that's ahead of us right there, currently it's white, but originally it was red and kind of, it was called the Red Square. Uh, again, ironically now it's very high end housing at this point but that was called the Red Square, and so originally it was on top of that building. And then uh, over time that got moved, that got bought by new people who then wanted to not have the statue, so there's a big back and forth about where the statue would go. It's this building right at the head is which originally the Lenin statue was on. And uh, so there's a big back and forth of where it should go, and eventually the building right next to the Angel Orensen Center bought it. Just one of those weird little stories about New York. Now we're walking down Houston Street. We're gonna we're in kind of like the last leg of this trip right here, this quick little walking tour of the Lower East Side. And a lot of people would consider that Houston Street right here is the boundary of the Lower East Side. As I was saying before though, historically, you would have even seen the Lower East Side go above this. We're gonna be talking just about a few food places some of them you may recognize the name of, some of them you might not. And uh, so we're going to just cross the street right here. I always kind of like to, whenever I have to stop at the street, just kind of like look around so you just get it like a sense of what would be around here. Just quick little sense of Houston Street. Houston Street's pretty important to New York City because it's where they started off numbering the streets above. So right, the next street above is First Street. So Houston is like zero street, if you will. That was a part of the commissioner's plan in 1811 to start numbering the streets above this. So when you go down below, then there's a lot of like weirdo names that don't really make any sense or anything like that. And when you go here, then it all starts being very organized as part of that commissioner's plan. And people get confused sometimes because it's pronounced Houston instead of Houston. That's because it's named for someone who, it was named for someone who's Dutch whose name was Houston. It's not named for Sam Houston, who the city of Houston's named after. Just to get that out of the way. In about a block or so, which is going to be our next stop, is Cat's Deli. Cat's Deli is strongly associated, rightly so, with a Jewish population and as a Jewish deli in New York. Really one of the most famous spots you can go. Uh, you're going to see when we walk up, I'm sure that there will be tourists lining up around the corner to go inside. Cat's Deli has different dates that you could say is its opening. Most commonly they associate it with 1903 when the name Cat's starts and it was uh, changed to Iceland and Cat's when it was originally the Iceland Brothers. Um, the current location goes back to about the 1930s. It's most commonly known for uh, tourists to go and visit. There's a big line, like I said, and uh, kind of most commonly known for like their ticketing system, which uh, 
if you visit, they'll give you a ticket when you enter the door, and you cannot lose the ticket. Can't lose the ticket because that's how you uh, everything gets charged under the ticket. If you lose the ticket, it's a fifty dollar tar- charge just to lose the ticket. So that's kind of one of its little quirks right here. But Cat's Deli was originally uh, a big spot for when I was talking about the Yiddish theater much earlier. This was a restaurant is frequented. There were actors, singers, comedians. All of this on the Yiddish theater, which would have been north of Houston Street, and they would come down here and hang out. A lot of it is known uh, for its pastrami. That's kind of the signature famous dish that people will get when they go and visit Katz. But Katz currently is kind of probably best associated with movies, specifically the very famous scene of When Harry Met Sally with Meg Ryan. That took place in Katz. There's a lot of other movies that's associated with as well. So that's one food stop along Houston Street and what you'd still consider the Lower East Side. We're going to be walking up to another one in just a little bit. And yeah, where we're heading to up here is going to be Russ and Daughter. Russ and Daughter, excuse me. Russ and Daughter is is actually traces its origins back to the push carts when I was talking about that before and how cheaply you could get the push carts. A guy named Joel Russ came in to Manhattan around 1905, started with a push cart, just had enough money for a push cart, was selling Polish mushrooms and expanded, expanded, expanded. He was able to buy the storefront in 1914. So after about nine years, there it is right there. You see Russ and Daughters. Um, the daughter's part is really notable because mostly when you'd have these family-run businesses, you'd say, and sons. That's because a lot of you know sexism associated with this is that only a male could take over. However, Joel Russ only had daughters, and he wanted the business to be lucrative. He wasn't trying to make a statement in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't a political decision. All he was doing was trying to have his business continue, and he knew that family-run businesses were more likely to gather up sympathy, gather up a, a more of a ongoing clientele. So that's why he had the name Russ and Daughters. But the daughters did work there. Ever since they were eight years old, they were actually working there alongside, and they did inherit it after uh, Joel Russ passed away. Currently, it's on its fourth generation to do so, so there um, now are still Russes that run the place currently right now. And as you kind of see, as we're going to be walking down the street over here, kind of the last part of all of this, we've gone through a lot of the history of the Lower East Side, of its connections originally to an early Jewish population, the original American Indians, then through the German population, then uh, more of the Eastern Jewish population that came in, uh, in through even the Chinese that came in in the 1950s. The kind of phase that we're in currently would be more of the gentrification phase, and the Lower East Side has one of the most clearly evident gentrification effects in the entire city. So the household population with incomes over 100000 between 100000 to $250,000 a year, went up by about, about 6% over the last few decades, and it's becoming an older and wealthier and whiter population to find in the Lower East Side over time, which is an interesting contrast to what has been initially. If you'll remember, initially it was further away from the traditional, what was seen as New Amsterdam. So it was where you would find a lot of these immigrant groups getting more of a hold on everything. And so that's just changed over time, continues to change. The pandemic has accelerated a lot of those changes as well. And um, so that's kind of what you'll be seeing more with the population over time currently. One of the last little food stops that we're going to be walking through once we get through all this scaffolding right here is the Kanish place that is more of just kind of a divey Kanish place, but as what some people say, it's the Yonah Shamil Kanish, Kanish Bakery. And so you can kind of see them out in the window right there. Since 1910, same family since 1910 right over there. So. It's just one of those places that people will always put on, you know, a Lower East Side food tour if you were to do that. Uh, there's just a bunch of them in a row, you know, so we talked about cats, and we talked about Russ and Daughters, and then there's also the Kanish place right there. But we're going to be wrapping up over here. There's uh, this little park that we're going to wrap up at. It'd be a nice little spot if you ever to follow this path 
on your own and go and do this tour. You can go and hang out in this park right back over here. We do, we do run a lot of tours through the company Free Tours by Foot, so highly recommend checking those out. There are Lower East Side food tours, there are other tours all throughout Manhattan into Brooklyn and all around New York City and around the world as well, so make sure and look at those at freetoursbyfoot.com. Yeah.